Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our the big lecture of the year, the Bryce Lecture. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to start by thanking the Bryce family, uh, whose generous donation has made this possible. We've been able to attract a lot of fantastic speakers because of that, like this lecture series. So as a token of thanks, I wanted to invite folks from the Bryce family to come so the ECE can thank them, present the plaque to our speaker. Great, thanks. Thanks once again. Peter. I, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Andrea Goldsmith. A uh, uh, lot of us follow Andrea's uh, research closely. We've been doing that for many, many years. I remember as a graduate student reading her paper, which I think she, it came out of her PhD thesis. It was a beautiful foundational paper, which influenced my own PhD work and subsequent postdoc work. And I made it a must read for all my students uh, since then. Um, so many of us know her through her amazing work through the years. Uh, beyond her amazing work in uh, information and communication theory, she's co-founded and served as a CTO of Plume Wi-Fi and Quantena. Quantena was just acquired so, uh, just a few days ago. I got a text message from one of my students who worked there. Hey, we got acquired. So, uh, so that's a great success story on the, on the corporate front. And she currently serves on the corporate and technical advisory boards for multiple public and private companies, uh, has held many positions in Maxim, MemoryLink, and AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, in addition, she is a member of National Academy of Engineering, an American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of IEEE, a fellow of Stanford, and has won many, many awards. So I won't even go through that list. Uh, it's a really long list. It's on the website. Uh, very inspiring. She's also author of multiple books. Uh, uh, the book on wireless comm is on my shelf. It's circulating around somewhere in the audience and the students. Also co-author on MIMO wireless communications and principles of cognitive radio, as well as inventor of 29 patents. So please welcome me in, uh, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Goldsmith. Thanks so much for that kind inf introduction. I didn't know you read my early papers and that they had so much influence, so that makes me uh, very happy. Um, it's great to be here. I've never been to Rice before, and uh, they've been trying to get me uh, for a few years. And it was really the Bryce lecture that motivated me to come, because when they invited me to come and give a lecture like this, I said, how can I turn them down? So anyway, even though I'm in the middle of revising the wireless book and I've been saying no to all invitations, I did say yes to this one. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's always a bit dangerous when you talk about what's next or what's beyond the current generation of any technology, because it's impossible to predict what's going to happen in technology, and especially since this is being videotaped, so you guys can come to me 10 years from now and say I got it all wrong. But that's OK. I'm going to still go out on a limb and tell you about my vision for what's next uh, uh, beyond 5G. So uh, I like to think I look young, but I've actually been working in wireless technology since the mid-'80s. I got my undergraduate degree in 1986. I was captivated by communications at the time. Uh, 1986 was just a few years after the first um, cellular networks were deployed in Chicago as an experiment. Nobody expected them to be as big as they are. In fact, AT&T was told by McKinsey and company that they should get out of the wireless business completely because there would only be maybe a thousand cell phones ever sold throughout the world. Uh, so that's the, with McKinsey, you get what you pay for, I guess. But anyway, uh, so the whole group at AT&T at Bell Labs that was working in wireless ended up moving to optical fiber in the late 80s. So this was the the 
you know, when I graduated in 1986, there was no Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi didn't even come about till the 90s. Cellular was just starting. So I ended up working in a, in a defense communications company and, you know, then went back for my PhD and so forth. But so wireless has been a fantastic field to be in my whole career. But I actually think that now is the most exciting time in wireless. And the reason is because up until this generation, wireless and whether it's Wi-Fi or cellular or other types of wireless connectivity, it's mostly been about people talking to people, which is what cell phones did, or um, people accessing information over the internet. So it's really been people in the loop of the communications, whether whatever the wireless system is. There's some exceptions to that, but those have really been the drivers of wireless communication, particularly through cellular and Wi-Fi. And what's different now in 5G, which I put in quotes because, you know, if you say, what is 5G? Well, you know, it's hard to define. It's what AT&T puts on its logo or it sells you in your new cell phone, but it's really like the next wave of wireless over the next decade, in my mind. That's what I talk about with 5G. And that is going to be much more about devices without people in the loop. And what that enables is things like not only the next generation of cellular and Wi-Fi, which we would have anyway, but things like smart homes, smart cities, smart spaces, autonomous driving, um, uh, in-body networks, uh, sensor networks around your body, um, the Internet of Things, which I'm going to define. So it's all kinds of applications that are really driven by device-to-device -device communication and extracting information from sense data and using that information in a positive way. So this is very different from the wireless networks we've developed up until now, um, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, in, in a second, but first I want to talk about one of the biggest challenges in these wireless networks is the fact that the license spectrum is quote unquote full. This is a, a slide from uh, an article by the FCC from a few years ago, which said that as of 2013, we were in 90 megahertz of spectrum deficit to support the exponential growth in demand for wireless data over licensed spectrum or over cellular networks. So that was six years ago, right? So if we were 90 megahertz in spectrum deficit six years ago, why is it that our wireless devices work at all? Anybody care to? I like interactive talk. So why can we still use our wireless devices when we don't have any spectrum for them to communicate in? License spectrum. Which is it? Television. Who watches television? <laughs> Any other ideas? So when you do wireless data, do you use cellular? No, you use Wi-Fi, right? I mean, anytime there's Wi-Fi available, you will typically switch to Wi-Fi. And there's lots of spectrum for Wi-Fi. There's 80 megahertz in the 2.4 gig band, which is the lower band, is pretty full there. But in the 5 gig band, you've got 300 megahertz of spectrum, which is actually quite sparsely utilized. So that spectrum deficit is only the license band. But of course, Wi-Fi has its own problem. It's unlicensed, which means you have interference. You have many, many devices that aren't even necessarily Wi-Fi devices in those same bands. So it's challenging to, to use Wi-Fi, but that is actually why we we continue to see exponential growth in wireless data because of the spectrum that's available in Wi-Fi. We also are now moving into higher bands. So we're moving into millimeter wave bands where there's tens of gigahertz of spectrum, and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, and then there's also another form of wireless communication, which I've been doing some work in, which is molecular communication. Now, you might say, is that really wireless communication? Well, there, where are the wires? There's no wires, so I call it wireless communication. And this is really the idea of modulating ones and zeros into chemicals, and I'm going to talk about that more later. It's a super fun area to work in because it's completely greenfield. It's like everything you know about wireless communication, traditional wireless over electromagnetic channels, doesn't apply anymore. So you get to start with the blank sheet of paper as an engineer, which is always fun. OK, so if we are in 90 megahertz of spectrum deficit, at least in the license bands, how are we going to support the Internet of Things? This, this prediction is a little bit old, that we're going to have 50 billion devices by 2020 um, uh, in the Internet of Things. But certainly, there are predictions of tens of billions of devices in the next few years that are all connected uh, wirelessly. And how are we going to support the Internet of Things if we don't even have spectrum to support the smartphones and Wi-Fi devices that we have today?
Now, the Internet of Things is one of the reasons why I think this next generation of wireless network design is going to be very interesting. Because the need for the Internet of Things, at least many devices in it, these small sensors or small devices that are enabling autonomous driving, are very different than smartphones. So smartphones have driven Wi-Fi and cellular uh, requirements for the last few generations that, you know, the more data you can get, the better. Um, latency has not really been to do real-time control. And energy consumption has not been a big constraint in smartphones because you can always plug them in. So this next generation of, of Internet of Things devices, many of them will be battery-powered that you can't necessarily recharge them or you can't recharge them for days or weeks or months. Um, also, many of these devices, the data rate requirements are much lower than smartphones. They're not trying to do video, which has been the big driver of wireless data. So, for example, for an autonomous driving application, you don't need so much data to do autonomous driving. The other really interesting thing about the Internet of Things is that the value in it is not that my heels can talk to Ashutosh's shoes, right? I mean, you know, our shoes may have sensors in them, but it's not that they're talking to each other. They're extracting data from me walking around and everybody else walking around and sending that data to the cloud and extracting information from that data. So we've thought mostly in, in terms of wireless communication about sending data. What is the data rate that I can send? And this is the data rate that video requires and this is the data rate that image requires. But when we think about extracting information, which is what we need to do for Internet of Things, we need this processing in the cloud that's going to extract information. But again, remember that these sensors are low power. And so how do we build a network where we can send the right data? Where do we do compression? We don't want to send worthless data up to the cloud. That's just a waste of the wireless resources. So thinking about where should the computation sit, how should we build communication systems that can support these very low energy constrained devices um, so that we can get the right data up to the cloud so that we can extract it. So these are new questions that we never asked before in our design of wireless communication systems. Okay, so how many people think they know what the Internet of Things is? Raise your hand. You've heard the buzzword a lot. Okay, about, you know, maybe a third of the people say they know what the Internet of Things is. I almost never see anyone define the Internet of Things. You'll see the prediction, oh my gosh, it's going to take over the world and there'll be billions of devices. But no one says what actually it is. So if I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things, I want to tell you what it is according to me. And again, you can disagree with me, but this is my definition of the Internet of Things. It's that basically it's a way to enable every device that has an on-off switch to connect to other devices with an on-off switch and to the Internet. Okay, So we already have devices like that. Certainly smartphones are like that and Wi-Fi devices. Anything that has Wi-Fi connectivity is like that. My car has Wi-Fi and cellular. But this is going to be a new set of devices beyond the traditional ones. So certainly if every artificial organ that is implanted has wireless connectivity, that's a very different paradigm than what we have today. If you think about my clothes are uh, full of sensors that are sensing my heart rate, that are sensing my pulse, this is a different set of connectivity than we have today. So basically any, if anything with an on-off switch can be connected to each other to um, have consensus about certain things. Like if you think about the organs inside your body, if you're about to have a heart attack and these sensors are sensing that there's something wrong, they can have some kind of consensus algorithm that they exchange and then send out an emergency response to 911 without you having to do anything. That's the kind of applications that this next generation of the Internet of Things is going to extract. And again, the value is in the cloud. Now, again, for somebody who's been in wireless, this is uh, so 1986, so we're going on, you know, uh, three and a half decades or so, a long time, right? I've seen a lot of hype in wireless. Ad hoc networks were going to take over the world. Sensor networks were going to take over the world. You know, there's been these strings of hype and then, you know, the trove of disappointment. Um, so you might say, well, is the Internet of Things real? Is any of this going to happen or is it just a way for us to put in our grants? This is going to change the world and then we get funding and fund students and everybody's happy. But in the end, it doesn't necessarily have the impact that we say it will. And I would argue that this is real. And the reason why is because you're already seeing this kind of Internet of Things and extracting information and getting value from that information from cloud-based computing 
<coughs> in a number of verticals exist before. So if you think about security or you think about transportation, if you've got Waze on your phone, which is using the traffic information that is being sent to it automatically to route people more efficiently than it could otherwise, <coughs> that's a really um, powerful application that's saving time, that's saving congestion. Healthcare, you know, you think about Fitbits, you think about um, sports professionals that are using sensors and sending that data up to the cloud or up to some central processing unit to figure out how do I run more efficiently or how did I, you know, how do I swing my golf club more efficiently. So I'm not saying that any of these are going to be the killer app for the Internet of Things. In fact, people often ask you when you're in Silicon Valley, so what's the next killer app? What's the next big thing? And my response is usually, well, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. I'd do a company around it, right? But, but the truth is, I don't know. I don't know if it's any of these. These may all go away, but the fact that there's companies that are building technology and making money in every one of these verticals is very different from the hype around sensor networks from a decade or two ago or the hype around ad hoc networks when Metricom was very big. None of those companies really made money. And so you could say, well, maybe they'll figure out how to. In Internet of Things, companies are already making money. So this is here to stay, and that's what makes it so exciting in terms of building wireless systems to support it. Okay, so this is another uh, question that I like to ask. I do work in information theory. Um, I showed you a graph which showed that we were 90 megahertz in spectrum deficit in the license bands, okay? So as an information theorist, you can ask the question, does that mean that we are the, at the Shannon limit of those frequency bands, that we've built our systems to be as efficient as they possibly can, and we just can't get any more capacity out of that spectrum? Or are we very far from the Shannon limit? And that means that there's a lot of room for improvement to get better capacity out of that, that spectrum. So how many people think that we're at the Shannon limit of wireless systems? Raise your hand. Nobody. Wow. Because when I go to conferences, often I hear like the CTO of Verizon, oh, we're at the Shannon limit. But I think that's actually very self-serving because they want to get more spectrum from the FCC. So if they say they're at the limit, then they're not under any pressure to build better systems. So does that mean everyone in the room thinks that we're not at the Shannon limit? Raise your hand if you think we're not at the Shannon limit. It's okay if you don't know the answer. There's a few people that didn't raise their hand either way. Okay, so you're all wrong because we don't know the capacity of most wireless channels. And this has been true since I was a graduate student. My uh, original PhD research was on the Shannon capacity of wireless channels. And we computed the capacity in a very specific case. It's a point-to-point -point channel where you know the channel perfectly at the transmitter and receiver, flat fading channel, you adapt to it, and, and that was the result. And, and by the way, the analysis behind that result, which is one of my best known results, it was a Lagrange multiplier problem. So like first year calculus. And I think the lesson from that is that it isn't so much that you need massive amounts of mathematics and analysis to solve problems that have impact, it's you have to formulate the right problem. And I think in that particular problem, that notion of adapting to a time-varying channel, which was intuitive, once you did the math behind it, it's like, oh, of course, this makes a lot of sense. So anyway, so that was my PhD thesis, at least part of it. But even even beyond you know, being able to adapt to the channel, we don't know the capacity of channels without models. And if you look at the molecular communication channel, which isn't Maxwell's equation driven, or even millimeter wave, which there's been some research on modeling millimeter wave channels, but to a large extent, we don't know those channels. If we're moving up to terahertz frequencies, we have no idea what the channel model looks like. We can't solve for the capacity of a channel if we don't have a channel model, okay? So we don't know the capacity of those channels. Time-varying channels, we only know in very specific cases where we know the channel perfectly. When we don't know the channel, which is true in practice most of the time, we don't know the capacity, we don't know how to adapt to it, we don't even know how to signal over it so that we can drive the probability of error to zero, which is required for Shannon capacity. Um, as soon as you move into channels that have interference or relays, those have been open problems in information theory for decades. And of course, cellular systems introduce interference intentionally. So if we don't know the capacity of a a channel with interference, we certainly don't know the capacity of a cellular system, nor do we know the capacity of an ad hoc network with any kind of relaying, and most sensor networks are ad hoc networks, so we don't know the capacity of those. And then finally, and this kind of came out of um, a lot of the work that I did at Quantena, we were actually building a system 
uh, where when you actually have to build a Wi-Fi chip, you need to start worrying about things like how much does it cost and how much energy does it consume. And Shannon capacity doesn't tell you anything when you have complexity constraints or energy consumption constraints or delay constraints, which is true when you're looking at a lot of these real-time applications. So you might say, well, why does anybody work in information theory if it doesn't tell you anything about anything, right? Uh, with respect, you know, there's a lot of people that work in information theory. And, you know, even though I'm being a little bit facetious about the fact that there's a lot of things about Shannon capacity we don't know, I would still argue that Shannon theory has provided the most insight into how to design wireless systems, at least at the physical layer. So if you look at the physical layer of LTE, it really is the Shannon capacity achieving technique for time varying channels is to, you know, break the channel up into little tiny frequency bands, which we do through OFDM, and then adapt in those frequency bands to the time variations. So Shannon theory provides a lot of design insights at the physical layer and also for multiple access. Um, and it also gives us upper bounds on performance. So it is a very, at least in all my work that I've done for the last few decades, Shannon theory has always provided me design insights and ways to ask the right questions about how to design systems in practice. Okay, so <clears throat> when we go to the part of the 5G networks that are gonna be requiring higher wireless data rates, which isn't all of them, but some of them, I want to talk a little bit about ways to increase these data rates. So there's two categories that we can look at. One is designing the networks better at the network layer. So I'm going to talk about that second. So rethinking the way we do the design and also something that I call wireless, uh, software defined wireless networking, which I'll talk about. But then we can also look at the phi layer and the MAC layer. And so what are the things that we can do there? Well, we can move to higher spectrums and we can go up to millimeter wave or terahertz. We can introduce mass and MIMO, but then we can even go back to the basics of modulation and coding and detection and looking at multiple access. Okay, so you might say, well, you know, isn't the physical layer dead? So the physical layer has been declared dead many times. Uh, the first time it was declared dead was in 1971 at a very famous workshop, uh, Com Theory workshop, which was called the Coding is Dead workshop because Bob McLeese got up and he said, you know, coding theorists were like rats in a cage. You know, we're chasing after these fractions of a dB and using, writing these papers that nobody but us understands and it's not having any impact in practice and we should just give up. Coding is dead. That was the Coding is Dead talk by Bob McLeese. And what happened is that Erwin Jacobs, one of the founders of Qualcomm, so this was 1971, right? He gets up, he's in the back room, he gets up and he pulls a little VLSI circuit, very small one out of his pocket, and he said, coding is not dead because of this. Because the computational power of VLSI is gonna allow us to actually build hardware that can do the coding that all our theory is predicting but hasn't had any impact up until now because the hardware couldn't implement it. So whenever someone tells you that something is dead, you should think about, but will technology evolve in a way that will make what we can't do today possible tomorrow? So that's what happened in 1971. It was declared dead, but then there was VLSI, and we made a lot of advances in coding and modulation and other aspects of um, communication system design. Uh, it was declared dead again in the 1980s, helped by McKinsey telling AT&T that there was no future in wireless. So everybody moved out of wireless. When Again, when I graduated in 1986, there were no jobs in commercial wireless communication. There were no faculty behind, being hired. Everybody was moving out of communications. But then cellular and Wi-Fi took off, and so it wasn't dead. And so that was great for me because I got my PhD in the 90s when everything was taking off. So, you know, you could say I was lucky or smart, one of the two. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there were lots of grants and lots of great students and all of these things. But then actually I would say within the last five years there's also been a slowdown of focus on wireless communication. It's helped a little bit now with 5G and the hype around 5G, but there was a notion that, you know, communications and wireless and information technology in general has plateaued. You know, it's a mature field. There aren't so many breakthroughs that we can do. I don't believe that at all because, again, I see technology evolving. I see what I painted as the picture for this next generation of wireless is going to have to do things that the current generation of wireless can't do with respect to devices that are low power, with respect to low latency, even at the physical layer, being able to guarantee certain kinds of data rates and, and reliability. So I think it's a very exciting time.
So I don't think it's dead. I think we have a, uh, someone, I think uh, Yuri Plyansky from MIT said, you know, wireless has been declared dead so many times and come back to life, it's like a zombie. So I think that my next image is going to be of a zombie. OK, so thinking about new, uh, so, so where are the opportunities at the physical layer and the Mac layer? So I think one thing is just new waveforms. So I, I'm an um, advisor to Cohere, which is a startup company that has a new waveform, orthogonal time frequency space modulation. And um, what's powerful about that waveform is it's very robust to changing channels that you can't adapt to. And I was very skeptical when I first learned about the technology. I said, you know, Physical layer is dead. There's nothing new to do there. But the truth is that there's applications where we can't use the traditional ways of adapting. We don't have channel information. So there is room for new waveforms. When you think about millimeter wave or terahertz, where you're at very high frequencies with very large bandwidths, is OFDM really the right thing to do? Is traditional modulation the right thing to do? I don't think we really know. I think we're just you know, taking the knowledge that we have from the systems we've built at lower frequencies and saying, well, it will work there. But it's not clear that that's the best thing to do. There's new coding techniques to be had. In detection, again, if you think about these devices that are battery powered that have very uh, high constraints on their computation, traditional techniques, especially for large MIMO systems or certain types of coding, are too um, energy hungry to actually work well in these kinds of devices. So we can actually rethink the way we design these systems from an energy perspective. And then uh, multiple antenna technologies, which I'll talk about more. Um, and then in terms of access, so if you have billions of devices, you really don't have enough spectrum to give every device orthogonal access, which means that we can revisit the notion of how we do access so that they may be able to step on each other because so, we don't have enough spectrum to give everybody their own private band, but then we're going to use signal processing and antenna techniques to mitigate the interference that results from devices that are using the same channel. So I think there's a lot to do with the fine Mac layer. And I'm just going to talk about um, a, a little bit of our work in this area. So I'll start with the notion of millimeter wave mass of MIMO. So again, there's tens of gigahertz of spectrum in the millimeter band. Um, I think it's uh, the, the hardware is not there yet to use the millimeter wave band in a cost-effective way for you know, large-scale cellular and Wi-Fi deployments. Um, but there's so much spectrum there that we are going to have to figure out a way to use it. Maybe that won't happen for five years or 10 years or 20 years as the hardware catches up and the algorithms catch up. But we will be using millimeter wave bands for wireless communication. Now, the, way, the problem with millimeter waves is that it has large attenuation and path loss, because path loss is generally inversely proportional to frequency squared if you just have a single antenna. So the way we get around that, and this was kind of uh, the brilliant uh, work of Tom Marzetta uh, from several, uh, I guess, a couple decades ago now, which said, you know, if you have an asymptotically large antenna array, then we get, not only do we get around the problem of path loss, because we're focusing the beam directly at the device that we want to talk to. So the reason that we have this loss of 1 over frequency squared is because the signal is rating out in all directions. That's the free, free space path loss formula. But if you channel the energy into this very pencil-thin beam at the device that you want to talk to, then the path loss is no longer inversely proportional to frequency squared. So it's fine to be communicating at those high frequencies. Not only do you get around the path loss that causes attenuation, there's also no multipath fading because you're pointing the signal directly at the Bryce family. And so there's no reflections that are coming off the walls because all of the energy is going in that one direction. There's also no interference for the same reason. So you can say, gee, you know, with massive MIMO, uh, all the things we've worked on for the last 20, 30 years in wireless communication, all those challenges go away because there's no fading, there's no interference, et cetera. Um, there's a couple, and, and the other thing is that because millimeter wave is at a high frequency, the antennas are small, so I actually can build these arrays with a large number of antennas, and they will fit you know, either on a large device or on the side of a building or on a base station. So you say, okay, great. Done. You know, we're done with their design for wireless. We've solved all the problems. We can go off and do something else. Um, but there's a, a few small details about this beautiful story. 
Uh, one is that you have to know the channel in order to point the beam in the right direction. So channel estimation becomes incredibly challenging because you're estimating a channel with hundreds of parameters associated with these base station antennas, and that's just for flat fading, not necessarily ISI. Um, the complexity of doing the MIMO algorithms is very high. So that's okay if it's at the base station because you may have a lot of complexity, but even there, there's limits on how much energy consumption the base station is going to cost because, you know, the carriers are paying for that. And then there's the propagation issue, which is that this picture looks really nice, but if there happens to be a building in the way, then that beautiful thin pencil beam that's pointing directly at the place I want to go gets scattered in all directions. And everything I just said about what's great about massive MIMO goes away. So how do we actually do this in a practical system? Um, you know, these are still very big challenges to being able to build millimeter wave mass and MIMO systems. So there's a lot of problems to solve there still. Um, one of the things, and I'm going to talk about this very briefly, this is joint work with my PhD student Tom Dean and my colleague Mary Wooters, is, okay, if channel estimation is a problem, can we do it blindly? Can we do blind MIMO detection so that we don't ever have to bother to measure this channel with hundreds of parameters? So basically what we've shown is that by using um, the structure of the signal, and this only works for very specific modulations, MPAM and BPSK, so it's limited. But basically if the signal is a hypercube, Sending it through this very rich scattering environment of MIMO, you can actually recover the signal by using the structure of what you sent to, um, to basically using a non-convex optimization problem to solve for um, the symbol that was sent. So essentially you're inverting the signal that you received based on knowing what the structure of the signal that was sent look like in limiting that structure to be either this BPSK or MPM. So we call this a vertex hopping algorithm, and it's basically using optimization to solve the problem. And there's a couple of really big benefits of this. One is that it's super fast, okay? So basically, if you look at vertex hopping versus kind of a traditional technique, it's way faster um, at least up to a certain size of the antenna array um, with a very high probability of success. At some point, if you're trying to do it and there's too many parameters for this non-convex optimization to solve, it can't solve it, and so it just returns a null. So it's very fast, and if you look at the performance um, compared to maximum likelihood, um, if you have channel state estimation error in maximum likelihood, you get, there isn't, there isn't a pointer, right? I, don't, I didn't see a pointer, but anyway, I'll just use the, the mouse here. So if you do maximum likelihood in either Rayleigh fading or additive white Gaussian noise, this is optimal if you know the channel perfectly, but if you have channel estimation error, you see that the, basically the bit error rate is flatlined because the channel estimation error means that you really can't decode the signal well. Whereas this vertex hopping, you see that's the blue one, up through a pretty high signal to noise ratio. And again, this is with the very fast decoding, you're able to drive the probability of error almost to what you get with optimal um, uh, uh, zero forcing with perfect uh, channel state information or gradient descent, which is optimal because it assumes that you know the channel perfectly. So this is just one example of kind of taking some of the challenges, at, oh, thank you, taking some of the challenges at the physical layer and saying, you know, okay, let's think about things differently. Let's say, forget about even trying to estimate the channel with all these parameters. Let's come up with a way to do detection without knowing those parameters. Okay, so that leads me to talking about machine learning and wireless communication, which I know a lot of people are here to hear about because this is the hot topic, right? So um, what we've shown is that machine learning trumps theory. Sometimes people say, why do you use Trump? So, okay, beats theory, okay? Um, so the idea is that, so when, you know, I'm someone, people that know me, I'm not a bandwagon person. So if everybody's working in machine learning, I'm gonna run the other way, okay? The way I got into machine learning for communications was the molecular communications work that we did because there's no channel model. 
and because there's intersimal interference because of the diffusion process. So my postdoc, Nariman Farsad, said, you know, um, why don't we try machine learning? Because it works well when you don't have a model. So I said, okay, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. And it worked very well, which is what got us interested in this topic. So basically, when would machine learning trump optimal Viterbi detection in equalization, okay? Well, it certainly won't when you have no complexity constraints and you know the channel perfectly because Viterbi detection is optimal, so you can't trump optimal, right? But as soon as you move away from that idea and you impose complexity constraints or you don't know the channel perfectly, just like what I showed in the vertex hopping, you can actually do better. So that's what we've shown, and I'll show you the results in a minute, um, but it kind of opened the door to using machine learning to other areas of wireless system design. So detection in unknown channels, which is what I'm gonna show you where we first used it, but then also maybe in modulation and detection if you don't have all the parameters, encoding, decoding. So we're actually looking at a lot of other areas to use machine learning, but in places where there is a reason why machine learning will do better than the optimal techniques that we've worked on for decades, okay? And of course, uh, you need the training optimization, which is something that there isn't a lot of theory behind. So even when you do the machine learning, how do you train, how long do you train, what's the right sequence to train, these are still things that are, that are open questions. So just to tell you briefly about our work in machine learning in physical layer design, uh, so this block diagram, if you open any book on communications, that's what it looks like, um, you've got a transmitter and a receiver, the channel is analog, maybe there's some additive noise, and you usually go through an A to G so you can do all your processing digitally. Um, so the transmitter and receiver are almost always designed based on a known physical channel model. But you may not know the channel, or even if you know the channel, uh, it may be too computationally complex to do the optimal algorithm, whether it's for equalization or decoding or MIMO decoding or so forth. So the idea of using machine learning based approaches can address both the fact that you don't necessarily know the channel perfectly and that you may have computational complexity constraints. Um, because you're learning the design directly from the data and often that can be lower complexity solution, not counting the training, which is a big caveat, right? So when I talk about complexity constraints, I'm not taking into account all the time you need to take to train. But even so, if you just say for the detection after the training, it can be lower complexity. So that's actually what we found. So we looked at, this is applying Viterbi detection to an optical channel and to a molecular channel. Um, in both cases, the and, and this has actually been published, so in both cases we're using a Poisson uh, model for the, uh, uh, for the channel. And the idea is that here, um, and, and this axis has, is complexity, so it's either constraining the complexity of the Viterbi detector or the complexity of the uh, neural network, and this axis is the bit error rate. So what you see is that the Viterbi detector, which is the blue squares, with perfect channel information, does better when you have no complexity constraint, as expected, right? So I know the channel perfectly, I have no complexity constraint, you better do best with Viterbi, which is optimal, right? But what happens is that even with perfect channel state information, as you start to constrain the complexity of that Viterbi detector, it turns out that machine learning, which is the red curve here, does better. And machine learning does better over Viterbi detectors with channel state information being off. So if you don't know the channel perfectly. So this is for the optical channel. The molecular channel, it's also a Poisson model, but it has much more memory because molecular has a longer diffusion process. And you see here that Viterbi only does better at the very high end of the complexity because there's so much memory in the channel, you really need a lot of complexity to overcome it. And so, the last thing I'll talk about in this domain of, of ML is very recent work that we've done, and I don't think it's even been published, which is to say, okay, so what I showed you before was just using machine learning to do the equalization without any assumption about the channel. But of course, we know something about the channel that we're trying to communicate over. So if you just, if you assume, okay, it's a traditional channel, but what I don't know is the probabilities that I would feed into the Viterbi decoder, how can I use machine learning just to learn those parameters and then apply traditional um, Viterbi detection? And so that's kind of what we're doing in, in these slides. And you see that the Viterbi net, if you know the channel perfectly, 
uh, which is, again, you're just learning these uh, P, Y given X, and then you're applying Viterbi Net, which is the machine learning applied to P, Y given X, and then traditional Viterbi, we actually do um, only a little bit worse if, um, if we don't know the channel. And Viterbi with no, uh, w without perfect CSI does much worse. And the training complexity is a lot lower than in the slide I showed you before, because the only thing we're trying to train for here is the unknown parts of the model. So, and you can look, and I could talk a lot more about all these results, but I think that the takeaway message is that, as someone who's a skeptic of bandwagons and so a skeptic of applying machine learning to absolutely every problem, there are places where machine learning has a role to play, and it's usually where you either don't have a model or there's some aspect of the model that you don't know, and then don't just apply a generic machine learning algorithm. Take what you do know about that model and apply the machine learning to what you don't know. So that's kind of the mega theme of this work. Okay, I'm gonna um, uh, just I'm gonna skip this because I'm running out of time. Let me get to the um, rethinking cellular system design. Okay, so the notion of cellular system design, where you um, lay out these cells and you put base stations in the middle of every cell and you reuse channels so you introduce interference. Um, I'm going to ask, when do you think that that basic premise, the basic premise underlying cellular system design uh, was written about? So there's a landmark paper that talks about doing this frequency reuse in cellular. So I'm going to ask you, which decade was it done? So I already said that the first cellular systems were rolled out in the early 80s. So it had to be before the 80s. So how many people think that that landmark paper that laid out how cellular systems are designed today, not the physical layer, but this notion of frequency reuse, how many people think it was the 70s? Raise your hand. How many people think it was the 60s? 50s? 40s? It was the 40s. It was a paper by Bell. Uh, who you can find the paper uh, that talks about this notion of frequency reuse. We have not changed the way we design cellular systems from that basic premise, okay? Even though we've done a lot in terms of improving the physical layer and using multiple antenna techniques and using multi-user detection, we haven't changed the basic premise of how we design cellular systems. So um, we can rethink how they should be designed. But at the same time, in thinking about this in the context of this 5G network, should we only be focused on capacity, which is what's driven innovation in cellular system design up until now? Or should we think about other things that matter, like coverage? If I'm doing an autonomous driving application, I don't care if I get to 10 gigabit per second, but I want coverage everywhere, right? Um, or are we going to focus on energy constraints? Because a lot of these devices are very energy constrained. So, I really think it's a time where we can completely rethink cellular system design in the context of what is the needs for this next generation of wireless devices. Doesn't mean that operators are going to necessarily follow this new design, but I think it's certainly a time that's ripe for rethinking it. So let me talk about that notion a little bit. My second startup, Plume, started life as a startup called Accelera, and the idea of Accelera was that we were going to take small cells, which we predicted this was um, 2011, uh, we're going to take off. It took another decade or so, or eight, nine years. So small cells are starting to take off now. But the idea was that you can't just, you know, deploy these macro cells and small cells and set their parameters statically, which is how it's done now, and assume that these networks are going to work well. What we should do is send the information up into the cloud and use the cloud to do dynamic resource allocation, okay? And the notion of that was um, self-optimized networks or SON. Um, so... The problem, and, and the reason we need small cells and large cells, so small cells drive capacity. You get exponential capacity increase. Uh, this was some of the earliest work I did as a professor in the 90s, um, that you know, by making s s cells smaller, we get much more capacity gain, but we still need the large cells for coverage. So all cellular networks are going to be hierarchical. We're going to deploy big base stations to have coverage. In rural areas, we're only going to have large base stations. And then in cities where we need more capacity, we'll deploy these small cells. And both large and small cells can be optimized in the cloud. OK, but so if you think about that notion, and um, in fact, that's what Plume did, although we ended up doing it for Wi-Fi, why don't you do this kind of cloud optimization for all wireless networks? 
So you think about what the idea of Plume now is that you have heterogeneous Wi-Fi access points. You send the data of the Wi-Fi access points up to the cloud, and the cloud optimization figures out what channel they should be on, you know, if you use multiple antennas, how you should set up the multiple antennas, what data rates different users can have. And you can do that uh, for cellular, for Wi-Fi, in fact, for any network, do this cloud optimization. Um, now, there's challenges of doing that, um, which I'll talk about in a moment after this slide. But if you think about this, I call it kind of the Shangri-La of using cloud optimization for all wireless networks, it leads to this notion of what I call a software-defined wireless network, where you've got a unified control plane, which is doing resource allocation not only within the different networks, but across them. So when people think about the concern about LTE moving into the Wi-Fi unlicensed bands, well, if you have this unified control plane, then it can manage the interference between the different networks. And the other thing it can do is take the application layer and say, so if you want to do, say, virtual reality, well, you would like that to go over the millimeter wave network, so you can channel or route the video over the millimeter wave network as long as that network's available. But once you move out of range of the millimeter wave network, then you can hand off to cellular, which has coverage there. And in fact, um, in the Shangri-La, which is always easy to do in PowerPoint and a lot harder to build, why do we even have networks at all? Why don't we just have a bunch of distributed antennas and then the unified control plane figures out how to use these antennas that are at different frequencies and so forth. So this is my Shangri-La. It'll never happen, but it's kind of a nice notion to think about. And there are certain aspects of this unified control plane that would apply to current networks. So what's the challenge of doing this? Well, there's algorithmic complexity. Again, some of my earliest work as a professor in the 90s was on frequency allocation for second generation cellular systems where we use frequency division. That was an NP hard problem. It's a graph coloring problem. So now, you know, that was second generation wireless. Now we have fourth generation wireless where we have MIMO and we have, you know, different power control and large and small cells. So I call this the NP really hard problem. You know, it's not just NP hard. But fortunately, we have you know, a lot of advanced optimization tools. That optimization has certainly advanced a lot in the last few decades. Um, one of the things we're working on now, though, and this was something that we ran into with Plume, was that if you send all the information up to the cloud, so this is the notion of cloud RAN, if you think about those distributed antennas, there's a lot of latency and cost to sending this up to the cloud, and then you have a very complex optimization problem. You can do things fully distributed, which is how Wi-Fi access points work today, but then you run into these local minimums that you can't get out of. So we came up with this notion in my research group of fog optimization, where you have a scalable radius of a neighborhood. As the radius gets smaller and smaller, it's fully distributed optimization. As it gets bigger and bigger, it's fully centralized. And the question we asked is, well, what is the optimal neighborhood? What is the trade-off in the complexity with respect to the size of this neighborhood in terms of the performance benefits? And by the way, you can also look in, at this problem in the context of optimizing caching and edge computing. So we've actually done some recent work on forming virtual cells of multiple base stations. So there's a clustering problem here, which is also a machine learning potential problem. So the idea is you've just got a bunch of base stations. You cluster them into neighborhoods of some size, and then you actually actually do the optimization. And once you've done the clustering, then you do the optimization. And what we found, so we've actually done uh, some work looking at both joint and single user decoding, and we found that, okay, to go from fully centralized to fully distributed in a joint decoding, so now you're jointly, each base station is jointly decoding all the interference, um, there's a 10x loss, but in fact, there's a sweet spot here where you don't lose as much, but it's a much more uh, lower complexity uh, problem because you only have, you know, rather than doing everything together, you have a small number of neighborhoods that are doing things. So this is very recent work. In fact, it hasn't even been published yet. It's been submitted and accepted to ISIT. So that's the first place that it will appear. Um, just a couple other quick things on cellular, and then I'll talk for a few minutes about the um, molecular and bio. So when you think about this redesign of cellular networks, if your focus is energy rather than capacity or coverage, um, or latency, then there's completely new ways to think about the design of this network. And in addition to designing the infrastructure, you have to think about how do we build radios that are extremely energy efficient? Because 
most of the technology behind wireless radios has been about getting to higher and higher data rates and using more and more complex techniques. And then you can even say for some radios, you know, maybe they're not even getting power from traditional sources of batteries um, or plugging them into the wall when they discharge. I like this note. So there's wireless power transfer, which has been around for a while. It's not well understood and it's not very efficient. But I like the notion of harvesting energy from the signals that you're receiving. So if I'm sending data, I'm sending a signal. That signal has energy. Why am I just extracting the data from that signal? Why don't I also extract the energy? So I think there's a lot of interesting things around um, looking at communications from the perspective of extremely energy-starved devices. Chemical communication, so again, I, I, I'll just say a few things about this. Um, I love it because it's a greenfield area of research. Um, when people ask me what are the interesting applications, I think inside the body, because we really can't do radio wave communication inside the body without worrying about damaging the organs. But chemicals are how the body communicates now. So the idea is encoding ones and zeros into chemicals, figuring out how they propagate through diffusion, and then decoding them at the other end. And, everything about this problem. Not only do we not know the fundamental capacity limits of these channels, because we don't have channel models, and also we don't even know the right way to communicate over these channels. Maybe it's through timing. Maybe it's through density of the molecules that we're sending. So this was uh, this problem was introduced to me by Nariman Farsad, and, and he came to Stanford about five years ago and built a system uh, using acids and bases. So Windex and vinegar were the two molecules that he used. And, and we used machine learning to equalize the channel because, again, since it's a diffusion-based channel, if you send the acid, it sits in the channel for a long time. And we actually got a 10x data rate increase using machine learning for this equalization over other traditional techniques. And that was the very first work I did in machine learning, which said, you know, there's a lot of potential for using this in places where there's no channel model at all for this. And so Stanford Report had an article about this saying, you know, researchers are sending text messages with Windex and vinegar, and it's not likely to replace how undergraduates text each other in the near future, but maybe at some point later on. Uh, OK. And so the last thing I'll talk about very briefly is the brain. So this has been my recent work, uh, actually over the last 10 years, so it's not so recent. I actually collaborate with Benham on one of the problems that we're looking at here. Um, so the idea of neuronal signaling is it's an electrochemical signal. You generate it in the neuron. It travels along this um, um, uh, axon, set of axons to the next neuron. And, and information is encoding through spike potentials. OK. so. Um, if, if this is neuron X and the signal is traveling to neuron Y, the way you look at the spike trains is you can embed them as ones and zeros if they're above a threshold. You say, so if it's below the threshold, it's zeros, and it, once it goes above the threshold, it's a one. So you can read the signals in the neurons as ones and zeros. And the way to understand if there's a connection from here to here, because these spikes are causing spikes farther down the line, so if there's a spike here, that may or may not cause a spike here, but you wouldn't have a spike here unless there were spikes coming into this neuron. So in order to understand connectivity in the brain, we started looking at directed mutual information, which is a concept that's used in information theory for systems with feedback. And the idea is that if you look at the directed mutual information between this set of x's and this set of y's, and it's positive, that's necessary but not sufficient for there to be connectivity. Why is not sufficient for there to be direct connectivity? Well, you may have a relay where X is spiking, which causes Z to spike, and then causes Y to spike. There isn't direct connectivity between these two. So the, so the first problem we looked at here was, can we use directed mutual information, a concept in information theory, to understand connectivity in brain, which can help us understand learning, how connections are formed, as well as degenerative diseases, how connections go away. So we looked at this um, in uh, using a simulator for a neural layout. And what we found is that if we use directed mutual information directly, we get some of these false positives. But if we actually also look at the delay, because there's some delay associated with the signal being relayed, we can actually get much better predictions of the connectivity based on this, uh, this work. So that was the first thing that we did. And the work that we're doing with Benham is, well, how much should you look back? 
what is the memory order of these ECOG signals? These are not stationary and ergodic signals. There's no good models for them. They're being generated by these spike trains. So we actually have some nice results on the estimation methods. The last thing I'll say about this work has to do with epileptic seizures. And this is actually, I would say, the work that I'm most proud of that we've been doing in neuroscience, because we've been working with the doctor. And the idea in epileptic seizures, um, the way a seizure happens is that you'll have one neuron here, say, um, which is the focal point of the seizure. And it starts oscillating in an unpredictable way. And because of that propagation of signals that I showed on the previous slide, when one neuron starts oscillating, it will cause the surrounding ones to start oscillating, which will then cause the surrounding ones of those to start oscillating. And eventually, you get a seizure. So if the epilepsy is drug resistant, the way the doctors um, treat it is they put these ECOG sensors on the surface of the brain, so under the skull. It's very invasive. And they look at the readings of the ECOG data, and they say, that's where it is. OK, that's how the doctors work, all right? So, um, so we said, well, maybe we can apply this directed mutual information, because it's the same idea. The signal is originating in one place, and it's propagating out. Can we use directed mutual information to find the seizure onset zone? And so we developed this algorithm, which beats the doctors in the few cases that we looked at, which was publicly available data. So by beating the doctors, what I mean is that the green circles are for this publicly available data, which also has the doctor annotations on the files. It says, OK, this is the region of the seizure onset zone. So what the doctor would then do is go in and cut out those neurons. And again, when you're talking about cutting out neurons, you know. Making a mistake has a lot bigger implications than if you drop a packet in a network, right? So our algorithm predicted the purple. So it's matching the doctors, but in a much more focal way. And this is completely blind. We're just using this algorithm of directed mutual information to identify the region. And so this was very promising, but there's a lot more work to do. So we're actually starting a collaboration with another doctor to say, OK, can we look at the post-operative data? There was some cases where our data did not match the doctors. Can we look at the post-operative data? Did the operation work? Did it not work? So there's a lot more follow-up to do. This is just very preliminary. But and, and the last thing I'll leave you with is the notion of, well, could we use these ideas for deep brain stimulation? So can we say, and again, maybe machine learning has a role to play here, where we say, OK, we figured out the region. Can we then you know, stimulate the brain, do the readings, and find a way to cancel out that activity to silence the brain? Uh, function that's leading to these epileptic seizures. So this is just a, you know, an engineer's block diagram. When you talk to doctors, they'll say, but the brain is not a block diagram. It's not, you know, and we don't know the models, but I think there's some interesting things to do here. Uh, by the way, this doesn't apply just to, to Parkinson's, but also, sorry, not just to epilepsy, but Parkinson's and depression also has these same kind of signaling in the brain. OK, so I'll summarize. Uh, basically, it's a great time to be working in wireless. I'm still super excited to be in the field I've been in my whole career. Uh, I think there is, and this isn't just for the grant agencies, that this technology will change people's lives. I really think that's why it's such an exciting time, because the applications that wireless can enable are very different and very transformative beyond just communications. Um, these future networks, there's a bifurcation, so we need to be able to support high data rates for some sets of users, and then this low energy and low latency for other sets of users, and it has to be one network or one set of networks that does that. Machine learning is a, a very promising tool, but it has to be used with care, um, as well as looking at you know, all these techniques that I talked about, small cells, millimeter wave, massive MIMO, software-defined wireless networking, energy-efficient designs, these are all open problems to, to solve. And then finally, I think that the tools and modeling techniques that we use in communications and signal processing have tremendous potential to impact other fields of science. And we're the ones that, if we collaborate with the right people, can do that. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. We can take some questions. So you, you kind of dismiss energy at the very beginning. You say, oh, energy is not a problem. You can plug it in. But my experience, my personal experience has been that with energy is not an issue with cell phone. Yeah. But Wi-Fi is an energy hogger. Yes. And I don't know, is it is something inherent, or this is just a matter of how things are implemented right now? 
And what happened is you move across the spectrum of different... So you mean parameters. the Wi-Fi chipset itself, or...? When, if I just have, if I just your have your mobile device on Wi-Fi, it just, it just is, is draining very fast. It's, it's an order of magnitude faster yeah. than, than what it's draining, power draining on cell phone. So I think that there has been more focus on making cellular energy efficient for the handset. That's been a focus from the very beginning because if you remember the early cell phones, first they were huge, right? But then, you know, draining the battery, people were out with their cell phones. They weren't able to recharge over the course of a day. So the protocols and the design of cellular has generally looked at how do we minimize the energy consumption of the end device. That's been built into the design of cellular from the beginning. Whereas with Wi-Fi, that was never the case, right? I mean, Wi-Fi, we were either using our laptops. I mean, Wi-Fi in cell phones is a relatively new thing, right? It's only been around for the last five years. And I don't believe that the Wi-Fi, I mean, as someone who's done two Wi-Fi companies, there have been companies on very low power Wi-Fi. They haven't been successful. And so the Wi-Fi chipsets that are out there, and like Quantena, for example, I mean, we were building high-end Wi-Fi for video distribution through the home. So we, you know, we had a four by four, or now eight by eight antenna. We never focused on energy consumption because it wasn't important. So I think the problem with Wi-Fi is that um, there's many, many different use cases, and the standard itself has not focused on, okay, should the driver of the standard be reducing the energy consumption of the handset? There's no notion of a handset in Wi-Fi, right? There's an access point and there's a, a CPE. So I think that the issue is not that there's reasons why you can't very ha have very energy efficient Wi-Fi in, in the handsets. It just hasn't been a big focus. Question for you on the Internet of Things part of the talk. And so um, you mentioned how we have uh, new design criteria. My question for you is about security. So if, if we bring that in, especially with medical and cars, what, what, what are your thoughts on how can we bring security into that? Yeah, that, that is such a hard problem. So security is we know. I mean, we get hacked all the time. Our credit cards get hacked. Our computers get hacked. And, um, you know, Every application of like, you know, cars that are connected to the internet get hacked. I mean, I think they showed that like the, the braking system of the Mercedes that was a connected car was hacked. And, and so how do we prevent that? You know, security, it's almost like an arms race, right? Whatever you develop, you have actors that are just trying to break it. And I don't think we have, um, most security sits the application layer. So this is another area. We've done a little bit of work in this on how do we actually use like the signature of the channel as an encryption key or something like that. I think that leaving security and privacy at the application layer limits to some extent the innovations that could come about because it's the same thing of what I described with the neuroscience. It's like we, electrical engineers, have tools, have modeling tools, have signal processing and communication and, and foundational tools that we can bring to encryption and privacy and security, but we've handed that off for the most part to our computer science colleagues that work at the application layer. And I think as long as that's the case, you know, if you're thinking about a little device that's energy constrained, there's no way you're going to be able to put, you know, people say, well, quantum computers will solve all this, not in the little Internet of Things device, right? So I think that there's a lot of room for collaboration between people that are building hardware, people that are building the communications to say, is there something about the way we're building these systems that could make them more robust from a security perspective. Like w one example is that uh, if you can pick up the signals coming out of my laptop, you can actually figure out what my keystrokes are, right? So if you know that, you could design the laptop in a way where you introduce some noise, or you, you know, th there's ways to jam the signal or to or to um, jitter the signal. So I think that it's a, a place where. If we're only going to rely on the people that have been developing security mechanisms up until now, I think it's going to be a huge problem. If we actually take security into account in the design of the devices and the networks as opposed to just leaving it at the application layer, I think that 
there are things that can be done. I don't understand it well, and I mean, it's not an area I work in, so I, even though professors never hesitate to talk about things they know nothing about, uh, in this case, I will uh, say I don't know much about it, so I'm going to defer to the people that are experts. I have a question on the machine learning part. And typically, machine learning looks like a black box, and there is hard to control, and there's no gradient. Mm -hmm. And I wonder that, OK, if something happened for that, OK, the, maybe the whole system looks like a Boeing 737 MAX. OK, basically, you cannot control for that. So how, 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 how could we overcome this kind of a black box of the machine learning? So at least in the work that we've done, I, I would, as I said, I would never kind of just throw a generic machine learning algorithm at this receiver uh, and be proud to publish a paper like that. Because what am I bringing to the table? I'm not a machine learning expert. Um, so I don't think I'm contributing at all to just apply a generic machine learning algorithm. I think that what we've learned in this work, the meta theme, is that first of all, why do I work in information theory? It's so that we have fundamental bounds. So we have fundamental bounds on how these machine learning algorithms should work under idealized conditions. Like I can compare the machine learning here against the Viterbi detector. The first work that we did in machine learning, which was for the molecular, the molecular, there was no channel model, so we couldn't compare it to Viterbi detection. We could compare it to existing techniques and we did better, but to me that wasn't satisfying. I want to know how close are we to the theoretical bounds. That's why we ended up doing it for this Poisson model. So here I can tell you that, you know, it's not a black box because I know what the channel is. I'm not telling the machine learning algorithm what it is. I'm forcing it to learn it. But I can actually have a Viterbi decoder that is the channel and I can compare. So I think that the, the, the role that electrical engineers, um, or at least the role that uh, I believe I can contribute to this work as a communication theorist and information theorist, is to take the knowledge that I have about the system and think about, OK, how is machine learning as a tool going to take into account that knowledge to do better than I could do with a generic algorithm. If we, with domain knowledge, can't do any better than an undergraduate who can pick up you know, some software tool to do machine learning, then we should not be working on that problem, right? But I think that there is a lot to be gained from the domain knowledge that we have. And I think this Viterbi net is a good example of that. So even though we beat Viterbi with a generic, it wasn't a generic machine learning algorithm, but it didn't take into account anything about how you do detection. It was just doing training and then a, you know, a, a, a recurrent neural network. And actually, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about this, but we actually developed a new neural network that was forward backward in, in terms of doing the detection. But anyway, what we did here is we said, what if we just have to learn these parameters? So we know there's an underlying channel model. It's just we don't know that, that, those probabilities. So let's apply machine learning to that. So I think where domain knowledge comes in is formulating the problem. OK, what should we be applying machine learning to? What should we compa compare it against? How do we do the training? That's something that's still very open. And I, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems like something where our knowledge about how these systems work and how fast they change and maybe implementing new feedback. So initially, when, when we started working this, I thought, we're not going to come up with new machine learning algorithms. But machine learning, in some sense, is just signal processing. So this notion of feedback, right? If you're doing data detection, you've got soft information, you can use that to update the weights in the machine learning algorithm, right? That's what we do in equalization. So why don't we do that in machine learning for equalization as well? So I think that it's our knowledge, our domain knowledge, and our experience in building these systems that uh, mean that we're not just applying this to a black box. We're applying it to a system that we know. And we should use that knowledge to design better and more intelligent uh, applications of machine learning. Actually, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you could comment about your experience as an academic before and after startups. Ha, yes, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I could give a whole hour talk on that. But so, you know, <laughs> uh, which I won't. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people think that um, 
there's a joke at Stanford that, you know, in order to get tenure, you have to do a startup. Well, okay, so that's not true. Uh, I did my startup after I got tenure. Uh, our former president, John Hennessy, said, no, you don't need to do a startup to, to get tenure. You need to do a startup to buy a house. That is maybe true, except that, <laughs> except that most startups don't make any money for their founders. So if you're doing a startup to make money, which was not my goal, uh, then you're probably going to fail. All right. So the reason why did I do a startup? I did because I'd, I'd worked in startups before. My first job was at a defense startup. And I really wanted to see here, I'd been working in theory for 20 years, right, doing wireless communication and MIMO and all this. Does all that knowledge matter when you go to build a product? You know, could I build a successful product and company around the te technology I'd been working on um, that would be successful? So, so that's why I did it. Um, and it was a wild ride, uh, but we did come out with the, and continuous Spontana still has the most um, highest performance Wi-Fi in the, you know, in the world. So, so the fact that my academic knowledge impacted technology that was built, that was hugely gratifying. The other thing that surprised me and was very gratifying, so I was going to Wi-Fi standards meetings, right? I'd never been to a Wi-Fi standard meeting. And, you know, they're mind-numbingly boring, I have to say that. But, you know, I thought, I'm not going to know anybody. I know people at conferences, but I don't know people in these standards meetings. And they're not going to know me. I was wrong. So in these Wi-Fi standards meetings, first of all, I ran into a lot of former students from Stanford and Caltech and Berkeley that I knew as a student. So they, they are people you know. But more surprising to me, they read my papers, they read your papers, they read our papers. Our work has a big impact on what actually gets built. And I did not know that until I went to Fontana. And so, and the last thing I'll say is, I was telling somebody this earlier today, is that as a, you know, comm theorist, signal processing person, life for us starts after the A to D, right? We don't worry about energy consumption. We don't worry about distortion in the power amplifiers. You know, we, we do algorithms, right? Well, when you go build a Wi-Fi chip, there's a heck of a lot that happens before the A to D converter. And so when I came back from my leave, I started working on A to D conversion and, and rate distortion of, uh, we call it analog to digital compression, where you go directly from the analog signal to bits. Um, I started looking a lot more at um, energy consumption and energy efficient wireless communication. So it really informed a lot of my research and my teaching when I came back, that experience. So to me, that experience of doing Quantenna enriched me significantly as, as an academic. And the other thing I'll say, so yes, Quantenna was just sold for a lot of money to a big semiconductor company, but that was not, in fact, I have very mixed feelings about that. The happiest day for me with Quantenna was the day it went public. I got to ring the bell at the NASDAQ. And you know, seeing your company go from, and it was a wild ride and not always a fun ride. I mean, I can point to the worst day in my career, and that was at Quantana, too. Uh, I won't say the best day was the IPO, because being a professor and the students give so much joy and, and, and mission to what you do. But um, you know, it's a wild ride. But, but going through that is also really a, a huge learning experience. So, so, you know, the IPO was great. The buyout, you know, the com when the company you've built will cease to exist, I have to say it's a little bit bittersweet. <laughs> All right, with that, we will stop the presentation for now, but there is a reception outside. Yeah, Please I'm happy to take to... more questions yeah. if people have questions. Sorry, I went Please a little Please come out long, but... and have a yeah, reception with them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.